So let me just start by saying this, the idea of choosing multilateral development banks as the vehicle to solve the world's problems. Um, this, in my assessment, uh, and I could be wrong, but sort of there, there are two sort of things that need to happen for, for your proposal to be successful. One is global cooperation, right? Uh, and the other is a very secular sort of prosperity, shared growth across the country, across the world. And both these, to me, look a little elusive right now. I mean, global cooperation looks extremely difficult at this particular point in time, um, as does shared prosperity. So maybe if you could just share with us a little bit about where you get the optimism uh, for any kind of global cooperation to actually work. Uh, I think that uh, I believe that the original mandate, if you recall, of the World Bank group, indeed of uh, all multilateral development banks, and there are a fair number now, and by some reckoning you'd be surprised if it, that the number of multilateral development banks could be in the upwards of 17, although the more well-known ones are uh, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, the European uh, Investment Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and for Latin America, the Latin American, uh, uh, AF Latin American banks. And of course, variations on that. But they are a fair number in the family of multilateral development banks. They have several unique features, since you alluded to them. First and foremost, there is no other institution which has the reach, transparency, and governance model which has stood the test of time. There is no other institution which has so successfully intermediated capital. For instance, uh, you would be surprised, Vivek, that if I tell you that uh, for the International Bank for Reconstru Reconstruction and Development, the largest in the World Bank group as such, Against a capitalization of just 22 billion, they have already lent close to 900 billion, which shows the extent to which they have successfully intermediated capital. This is not so for private sector, but we'll come to that. Now, if there is no other institution which has been able to do this, if you add to that the lending of other multilateral development banks, on an average in, say, 2019, leaving out the pandemic years where the lending bumped up, they have done about $130 billion a year, which if the basic core of our report is to be accepted, we intend to triple. We intend to take it from $130 billion to closer to $400 billion of concessional and non-concessional finance, an equivalent or more from private capital, adding to a trillion, and then if you add two trillion of uh, what we hope will be domestic resource mobilization, a ballpark figure of roughly, let us say, three trillion is what we believe and experts believe the world would perhaps need to, between now and 2030 to be able to address, as you say, the issues of uh, poverty, uh, shared prosperity, and the challenges of transboundary global public goods and climate being the most important factor out of that. So that's the kind of recommendation and the thrust of the recommendation. Where is the international cooperation coming from? Uh, I do not know. Uh, uh, Larry would, would have his own perspective. But I think that the reception which we have received to our first set of recommendations have been more optimistic uh, than, uh, than uh, we, had, we had reckoned. And there's a fair amount of traction even as they await our second report, which is due to be given in Marrakesh on the, uh, at the time of the annual meeting of IMF and, and World Bank. So in the world, uh, Larry, of, uh, in, in this world, the G20 world, which you know, we're from outside, we don't really see how the workings happen and you know, how you guys actually get stuff done. Um, there's a lot of interest in your report. It's been well received, what we hear, as you say. How, what is the lag between that well-received and actually money committed? Um, what goes into it and how long is there that lag? 
Look, nothing is uh, certain, but the United States and the Soviet Union at the height of Cold War managed to cooperate to ban nuclear tests in the atmosphere. They managed to cooperate to scale way back smallpox and uh, polio. They managed to cooperate to limit nuclear proliferation. So it's just not right to say that because there are tensions, there can't be cooperation. Indeed, the task is to find ways of delineating some spheres in which cooperation is mutually beneficial and will take place, and to hope that over time, the set of those spheres will increase. And that's the opportunity that's presented by climate change, global health, global public goods, and working through uh, the MDBs. T to steal the phrase that Milton Friedman used when he talked about uh, monetary policy, the lags are long and variable. Sometimes uh, things happen very quickly. Sometimes it takes a longer time period. I think there are, there's a lot underway. We, are, we argue very strongly in our report that modern finance permits the balance sheet of the World Bank to be used more aggressively. And that recommendation, I think, essentially everybody agrees to, and it's in the process of happening. We argue for something known as hybrid capital and for the use of guarantees. It's an alternative kind of financial instrument. Think of it as a kind of convertible debt that can function as capital. That's already happening, and you'll see further announcements about that in Marrakesh. We argue for a tripling of lending by 2030. Everybody agrees that lending has to go way up. There hasn't been an agreement on that target yet, but it may come. There's not yet a formal statement of the necessity of a capital increase, but there's growing recognition of the need to review issues around uh, capital. So I think this is all very much in train. I think it's part of something very large. When N.K. and I first met 30 years ago, it would have been inconceivable that there would have been a global table analogous to the G7 at which India was functioning as the chair. It would have been inconceivable that if the world had a group to ponder the future of the MDBs, it would be co-chaired by an Indian and an American. So the world's moved a long way, and reports like ours are part of the process of uh, keeping it moving. I would be surprised, very surprised, if a year from now you didn't see a clear imprint on the ground in terms of the movements of money as a result of our report. And I would be very surprised if three years from now, there wasn't still further work to do to implement all our recommendations. But that's the way these things uh, work. I've always been uh, very inspired by a story that President Kennedy used to tell quoting uh, Jean Monnet, who was a central in the finding, founding of the European Union. And Jean Monnet told the story of a guy and his gardener, and his, the, gardener asked, the guy asked the gardener to plant a tree. And the gardener said, okay, and the guy asked a day later, have you planted the seed? And he said, no, you know, it's going to take decades before this seed amounts to anything. And the guy said, well, then plant it this morning. And that, I think, captures 
an important truth about what we're all working on. We don't have that much time with respect to these uh, issues uh, around, um, around climate change. That's why the first sentence in our report is the first sentence I used when I had a chance virtually to present, the, present our work to the G20 ministers and governors. The world is on fire. And when the world's on fire, you have to try to contain uh, the fire, not sit around the firehouse debating just how you're going to organize yourself for future fires. You have to start fighting the fire. Absolutely. NK and I are proposing a set of measures that we think will substantially increase the efficacy of the world's efforts. Well, that's fantastic. And more power to you. And good luck. And you know, we hope you're successful at that. Um, the, the seed that you're planting, um, is it, it, does that seed come sourced from the developing world or is it sourced from the developed world? Look, I think one of the big things that's happened, that needed to happen, and it has happened, it's one of the two or three things I'm most proud of from my time as Treasury Secretary under uh, President Clinton, is the world's major grouping is no longer the G7. Yeah. It's now the G20. And that's a, a grouping in which every continent is recognized. Uh, now, especially with the Organization of African Unity yeah. uh, joining the G20, I, I think uh, that asking whether the impetus is going to come from the industrial world or the developing world is asking, like, which blade of the scissors is going to cut the piece of paper. The truth is they're both indispensable. And um, yeah. that's, what is, that's what is happening. And so by the way, at a time when India has $600 billion in reserves, this whole notion of their countries that give money and their countries that get money is a much more of a spectrum thing than uh, it used to be. So, um, you know, if we fast forward to 2030, which is where your report is kind of laying out a roadmap to 2030, are you conceiving a world where these development banks are going to raise money from the developing world and deploy it also to, to the developed world? Because right now, most of the focus is in the developing world of how the money gets deployed. I don't anticipate that the development banks are going to deploy money into the developed world. I think there are all kinds of issues and constraints in the developed world holding back um, as much energy efficiency, uh, as much reliance on renewable energy as we would like, but none of them have to do with a lack of ability to borrow right. and the kind of constraints that the development banks uh, can alleviate. Yeah. Mr. Singh, there is, a, there is a notion that most of these institutes, these global the institutions of global cooperation, most of them have a disproportionate control coming out of Washington. Um, you know, if we are going to now sort of contribute to this $1 trillion target, government and private sector both, um, do you think, are you advocating more say from developing world and managing these banks? Let me put this, let me put this, this way to you. Uh, we debated and discussed this issue. We felt really that the balance of advantage, uh, at least in the short, if not the medium term, lay in not raising the issues of the reallocation of the voting rights within the multilateral development banks. And uh, yes, it is true that for, the United States currently has 16% of the IBRD. And similarly, it is the single largest shareholder in several of these multilateral development banks. We had an option of either allowing that issue to be settled, and as Larry said, that would be a very poor response to the issue of the world being on fire. We have taken a somewhat more pragmatic view that within the framework of the existing structure of how to substantially augment that, triple that, as we say, 
taking, for instance, concessional finance from 30 billion to 90 billion, it will have a huge impact on countries of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it will have a huge impact on some low-income countries. We are contemplating taking 120 billion of the, from the other MDBs to closer to 400 billion. This will benefit uh, low-income countries, but certainly it will also benefit middle-income countries. I mention middle-income countries because we recognize that as far as the issues of the growth of infrastructure and investment, along with growth, where there are choices, technology choices, or moving towards uh, more use of more renewable fuels and greater dependence on economic activity on renewable fuels, uh, middle-income countries have a very important role to play. So I think that we are substantially augmenting the ability of these international institutions to address the kind of issues which we mentioned uh, germane to the charter of most multilateral development banks and the original one, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, coupled with the other th things which you have mentioned. So you, you've, put a, you've spoken a bunch about private sector uh, investing in the, yes. in the MDBs. Yes. What's the pitch? Well, how do you... I'll tell you, the big picture, and uh, this is something which has filled uh, uh, Larry with great, uh, great worry, uh, and, and equally all of us. So when I mentioned to you the huge uh, ability of uh, the multilateral development banks to leverage things effectively, and against 22 billion, if they have lent uh, 900 billion, you can see the leveraging. Against that, and in sharp contrast to that, one dollar <laughs> has only garnered 0.6% of private capital. That has to decisively change. And one of the things that uh, we are looking at very closely in our second volume is, for instance, how do you harness uh, uh, capital, private capital innovatively, hybrid capital, blended finance, greater application of the cascade principle. How can we harness the power of guarantees? Guarantees have hardly been utilized, but they have a huge ability to be able to get leveraged. So how does one really use guarantees more effectively? And what kind of risk mitigation for private capital to be enticed would be consistent with issues of moral hazard, where the gains are not private and unreasonable gains, and the risks are public? So, uh, really speaking, what would that be? Would, for instance, giving some kind of an assurance of managing foreign exchange fluctuations and risks on currency movements be a strong incentive? We are looking into issues of risk mitigation to be able to harness private capital in a more meaningful way, taking it away from just 0 0.6 to, let us say, 1.4, 1.5, and that would make a substantial change in the nature of the financing of all these things which you have talked about. A 10-year Treasury bond today, uh, a US Treasury bond, is a 4.55% yield. Um, isn't that making it harder if these rates keep going up? Wouldn't that keep making it harder to incentivize private sector to invest in MDBs? What the, the risk reward? Uh... Look, of course it is any kind of investment is less attractive with a 4.5% interest rate than it is with a 1% interest rate. That's why it's more important now to get MDBs involved in this space than it might have been five years ago. Five years ago, you might have thought that the private sector could do it by itself with 1% interest rates. Now that we're in a higher interest rate period, the extra containment of credit costs the extra duration that the uh, MDBs are enabled to uh, undertake, the extra guarantees they're able to provide their capacity to influence policy frameworks in a way that make private sector lending more attractive, all of that is more important than in the sort of artificially easy times of uh, near zero interest rates. And, you know, nobody knows, but my it's guess is that interest rates are going to stay high for a while, and that if they don't stay high, it is going to be because um, 
the world economy softened and uh, export revenues were, that countries had were reduced. So I think we're headed into a macroeconomic period when supported financial intermediation to address global public goods has never been more important. And the, you know, we've spoken a lot about the, just this entire sort of U.S. economy, sort of every step that the U.S. economy takes, how much of an impact that does have on the world today compared to when it was 10 years ago? Because, you know, this phrase soft landing, soft landing, I've been hearing it a lot <laughs> of late. Uh, and I think just two days ago, uh, the Fed is saying that we're, we're closer to a soft landing now. Um, will that kind of do you agree with that? Will that help the situation that we are in right now? There were a lot of parts of that. A soft landing is better than a hard landing, and a soft landing is better than no landing, because the plane eventually has to land, and if it lands closer to when it's running out of fuel, it will be a harder landing. So I think we, we all should be hoping for a soft landing, and I think the Fed is now positioned in a reasonable way to maximize the prospect of a soft landing. But I think the reality is that what Samuel Johnson said about second marriage is true of soft landings. They represent the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> and that historically, when unemployment has been below 4% and inflation has been above 4%, before too long you got into a recession um, or you got into accelerating inflation. And I think the risks are tilted that way. They're still tilted right, that way. Uh, tilted that way right now. I think the odds are per perhaps two in three that we will either head into a hard landing scenario or a no landing. Uh, scenario, or possibly a stagflationary scenario in which the economy turns down, but inflation doesn't moderate all the way to 2%. Now, the statistics have come in a bit better than people expected for the last several months, and so it's possible that we will, that hope will triumph over experience. Sometimes it does. And but you've been consistent, this, the 33%, the, the, the one out of three chance of a soft landing. You're still consistent on that one out of three chance. That's about, that's about what I would say, yes. And if, if that were to happen, uh, irrespective of whether we have a soft landing by the American economy or not, what is the impact that the American economy has on the world today compared to 10 years ago? Look, I think the world economy has a larger impact on the, uh, the American economy has a larger impact on the world economy than any other economy. Um, the U.S. imports are a large engine of growth or not an engine of growth for many other countries. U.S. foreign investment in the supply chain that serves the U.S. is a major driver of international commerce. The dollar has a special role in the international monetary system and so you see other countries' interest rates move with the dollar, even at times when there isn't anybody trading in their country because it's the middle of the night. So yeah, I think the U.S. continues to have a substantial impact because on, the world, on, the, on the world economy. And uh, the relationship with China, relationship with Russia notwithstanding, I mean, even with all those tensions, uh, you don't see the American economy having less of a role than it did 10 years ago. Of course, it's the largest uh, sort of factor in the world. Look, if you look, I, I, it's not a matter of what you feel, it's a matter of data. And if you look at the US share of global GDP, yeah. it's really very high by historical standards right now, historical standards of the last generation. If you look at what in some ways is a better, more forward-looking indicator, the share of the United States in total global stock markets. That number is higher than it's been in a very, very long uh, time. So I look at those things yeah. and I see an American economy that I think for better or for worse is likely to be fairly central 
to the global economy, very central to the global economy for a long time to come. Do you think the dollar will, for the long time to come, remain the global currency? or Because we keep hearing that that's kind of being questioned now. I've been doing this for 30 years since I was in charge of dollar policy um, uh, under Secretary Benson at the beginning of the Clinton administration. There has never been a five-year period when there wasn't an upsurge of concern about the dollar losing its role in the system. Okay. And there's never been a moment when that concern proved warranted. I believe if you look at the history of currency transitions, most notably the transition away from the British pound as a reserve currency, I think the lesson is pretty clear. You don't lose your reserve currency status until it's far from your biggest problem. If we inflate our currency away, if we don't maintain a, st a stable legal environment, if we turn very strongly inwards, if we have high inflation, if we politicize the use of the dollar, yeah, we could, the dollar could conceivably lose its role. But after all of that had happened, it would be sort of the least of the United States' problems. <laughs> so I think if we keep the fundamentals of what we're doing reasonably strong and do things right, the dollar is likely to take care of itself. You didn't mention deficit in that list of things. So if the deficit keeps going up and the, and the American economy keeps printing more notes, that doesn't risk the dollar's stability as a global currency. Look, um, these things are about choices. Um, there's a wise crack that I used to utter. It's a completely unfair wise crack, but it sort of does make a point, which is... Europe's a museum, Japan's a nursing home, China's a jail, and Bitcoin's an experiment. Well, you don't like to actually believe any of those propositions in any literal sense, not to, not to recognize that if you take your money out of dollars, you have to put them somewhere. Yes. And <laughs> the available places to put it don't look all that attractive relative to uh, the dollar. No, they which don't. Which contributed to the strength of gold, uh, to be, uh, to be yes. fair. But that's my sense. I believe China is buying a lot of gold now, quite openly. Uh, so, so, but, but that's China alone, I guess. And that's, Mr. Singh, well, how does this, what happens with India in, in, the, in, the, in the picture that, uh, that Larry has painted? How does India stack up? Have we, have we picked our friends well in this very fragmented world now? Well, I think that uh, we have been debating and discussing about India. And uh, what I, Larry has been saying that looking at the current growth trajectory, an eightfold increase, uh, given some favorable global conditions, given the continuation which we see of macroeconomic stability, a coherence in the behavior of monetary and fiscal policy, a continuation of the economic reform momentum, which continued even during the pandemic years, and given continued uh, likelihood of political stability in the near term, I think that getting states to act more aggressively to be partners with the central government on many issues of changes in the factor of production, particularly on land, the bulk of the reform story is really been done, except that we need to fine tune our regulation and legal system in multiple ways to be able to continue to attract large volumes of inward flows. But overall, all these things taken together, I think it is, uh, there is a very high probability that we will continue to grow at about uh, seven to eight percent, if not more than seven to eight percent. Don't also forget the transformative nature of technology. Uh, very few countries have been able in such a short time to harness the power of digital technology in multiple ways as we have in terms of the governance architecture on which, through which now, I mean, it used to be traditionally said, Vic, when you were much younger, that a lot of the money that the government spends is completely wasted. Digital technology 
and the direct transfer has offered alternative, very viable ways in which we, for instance, during the pandemic, instead of doling out cash, yeah. are able to do it in, in a different way. If you begin to apply all that and the digital transformation into healthcare systems, into education, into agriculture, there is, I think, a huge multiplier gain and the expectations of optimism the world has about India are more likely to be realized than not. Um, I mean, you're all obviously optimistic and we must be. But today's report, Moody's is expecting a 4.5% growth for H2 uh, uh, for India. So, uh, and I, th I think, you know, Larry's made a lot of news saying 8% uh, is, is the imagined growth that India kind of has. Um, with your experience, uh, how do we achieve 8%? What I've said, to be clear, is that 8% seems to me to be a very ambitious but not completely unreasonable stretch growth target for India. It is not my prediction of how fast India will grow. It is an aspirational statement for India. I think India's ability to achieve it depends on four things. It depends on one thing that's beyond India's control. Is there a reasonably stable, reasonably prosperous, reasonably rapidly growing global economy? Depends yes. on all kinds of things with all other countries and depends a lot on just how large an impact AI has okay. over the course of a generation on uh, growth. Second thing is it depends on the willingness of India to continue the hard work of reform, whether it's the hard, whether it's the hard work on uh, agricultural sector, whether it's the hard work of continuing reform, reducing financial repression in uh, the financial sector. Perhaps most fundamental for India are the set of issues around uh, fiscal federalism and the relationship between the state and the national governments and the many places where competition between the states or non-overlapping state election cycles lead to unsustainable or unfortunate policies at the state uh, level. That though is also India's low-hanging fruit, that India has more people who are left far behind right now than China does and getting them fully included is a route to success. I think the third thing that uh, will determine what happens in, in India is its approach to openness in the world. Traditionally, self-reliance has been an important word uh, in Indian economic policy. When I hear that word, I get nervous because obviously there's some things where a country needs to be self-reliant, but very often self-reliance can slide into being a general defense for protectionism. And in some areas like have inbound foreign investment, I don't think there's any legitimate uh, kind of uh, argument against uh, openness. So I think India needs to take a much more open uh, approach. And the last thing is, if I envision a highly successful India 20 years from now, I think digital technology, yeah. IT, possibly quantum uh, computing, and the ability to harness and deal with huge quantities of data are likely to loom as important sources of Indian advantage. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Singh, do you agree with, uh, I mean, do you guys agree about this? I, I, I mean, I feel like uh, the protectionism and the self-reliance, the Atmanirbharata of India, uh, it's become such a popular political slogan now. Uh, and, and, you know, we... Whenever my conversations with anybody in the finance ministry talks about one thing and one thing only, productivity. They all say productivity in India is lagging behind. Manufacturing sector is not picking up. For that, you need to allow the, the Indian uh, players to kind of invest and improve efficiency. Well, uh, let me address this by saying uh, that you recall that in 1991, uh, India had perhaps the highest rates of tariff. Uh, we had quantitative restrictions. And the first area of important economic reforms were trade reforms 
before we began to look into structural reforms. And that was very substantially and very happily completed, even that we sought to align our tariff rates to average rates of developing countries. Now, I think that uh, over time, one of the issues which we cannot overlook is that uh, geopolitical and other considerations, obviously t in, the, in every country's national interest, would want to look into making sure that your dependability of supply chain uh, was assured in critical areas. And that's one area where I think that everybody will agree uh, that uh, that would demand some area where production needs to be substantially made more competitive, so perhaps maybe through these uh, investment schemes which we have, yep. or subsidy of one kind or the other, but uh, these are all transitional because we recognize that no country can achieve long-term sustained 8% rate of growth without a degree of openness of the economy and without trade becoming an engine of growth, which we know very well it needs to be fully harnessed. But in the process, clearly, national interest would really require that uh, we do not become hostage to unsurprised interruptions in the supply chain due to events uh, which could be purely exogenous. And it would be very unwise to overlook that degree of possibility considering some recent experience. So you're saying it's a good risk we're taking to, for instance, try manufacturing semiconductors? Actually, we're hedge, hedging the risk, yeah. not taking the risk. I think that the ability to be able to substitute supply chains, if supply chains become jeopardized, is hedging the risk in terms of other possible consequences which could have larger multiplier effects. Is, um, you know, because you're on the, the one, uh, one, one India, one election uh, sort of uh, group and you're kind of, it's not a group in task with figuring out whether it's a good idea, you, you're running the group in task with how to execute this idea. So um, is, that, is that one of the things that'll, is, are we moving to a more presidential form of government where that'll kind of, uh, help us achieve 8%? I don't think so. I think it would be... Uh, but one thing before I answer that, I'm somewhat uh, curious that even Larry has picked up that the discontinuity in the electoral cycle is a serious detraction, not only from governance, but a serious detraction in terms of uh, what may be called a, a pursuit of not very wise macroeconomic policies mm. when aggregated together through this kind of a continuous slipped uh, cycles of election. So uh, I'm, I, I'm quite pleased that Larry has mentioned that as uh, one of the areas where we need to be careful. But to address your question, uh, look, uh, I think it is very clear two things. First, let us not forget that for more than 20 years plus, all elections were together. This is not something which we are suddenly importing. And the people who had mastered this were people who were in office at that time, really felt that almost every government, almost every political leader, has some point or the other felt <clears throat> And that this is a matter which has been in public debate and domain for a much longer period of time than has been currently reckoned from two successive reports of the, of the commission, which is supposed to be the Law Commission of India, very composite two reports, two reports of the Parliamentary Standing Committee, which comprise of all political parties. So I think that... Uh, I do not, and the fact that we must recognize that wherever elections have taken place simultaneously, to give you an example, for instance, uh, those some of the states where the state elections were held at the same time as the general elections, people differentiated on the kind of choices which they made for state leaders as compared to what they made for national leaders. And the one doesn't translate to the other and therefore, these fears of whether it could lead to presidential form of government or not is not borne out by the data which is available to us. 
Uh, but that's something for the, which the committee will take up uh, as it considers appropriate. Uh, I'm a member of the committee, but the committee uh, will take all these issues into consideration. But you sound excited by the challenge. I mean, you sound like you believe in the cause. Pardon? You weren't assigned to the cause. It sounds like you believe in it. You, you want, I mean, you kind of, you, you, have, you have faith that this is the right thing for Well, you. well, let me put it this way to you. If you read the notification, any committee, any committee addresses its mandate and its terms of reference. And if you look into paragraph one, two, and three of the noti notification constituting the commission, it does not prevent the commission, uh, the committee rather, not the commission, to examine these issues. But uh, it's certainly it's a very cogent way in which it wants the, the committee to look into some of these complex issues. And the issues are not only, if I might remind you, center and the state elections, the issues are also about municipalities yeah. and urban local bodies, where after the constitutional amendment, elections are taking place periodically there as well. Mr. A little unfair question, we move on from this topic, but what are you going to tell the chief minister who's going to lose a portion of his term? What are you going to tell him? How do you, how do you get him on board? We haven't even begun the work of this committee, and therefore the question is not only unfair, it is it is very, very, very premature. You began by saying that I'm a member of that committee, which is a fact, and I gave you a little background, drawing a little hint from what Larry said in the sort of things uh, which could be challenges as far as India's continued long-term growth story is concerned. Uh, Mr. Singh and then Larry, we'll get to one thing, then we'll open up to the audience, and then we'll do a quick rapid fire, where I want you guys to have some fun with the answers. Um, U.S.-China relationship, um, how important is that? How closely are you all watching it? Uh, and how much of an impact does that have to your proposal? Is it to me? Or Both of you, yeah. U.S.-China. Yeah, Larry, go first, sure. U.S.-China relations. <laughs> They've been better. <laughs> um, Look, I think the U.S. and China share one world. The U.S. and China both want significant improvements in living standards for their people. The U.S. and China, neither of them wants military conflict and all the diversion of resources that that would result. So there are some very real shared interests on which uh, to build. Unfortunately, I think the mood in both sides is a bit caught in a self-fulfilling spiral of negativism about each other. From an American point of view, wolf warrior diplomacy, rapid increase in military spending, including offensive military capabilities, very substantial escalation of anti-American uh, rhetoric and aggressive intentions towards other parts of the Pacific. All of this is ominous. Um, if you're Chinese, I suspect you can point to some American rhetoric that is problematic. And I think we need to be very careful at a moment when the Chinese economy is quite vulnerable. We need to do what we need to do to protect our national security, but we need to not do more than that. And I'm concerned that too many people conceptualize this as economic warfare with China, which I don't think is a constructive posture to see the relationship in. Um, you know, the fact that America, when you know, a lot of these, in, in, these global cooperative institutions were formed or, or have run, America was at the top of that pyramid. I mean, in a sense, America was clearly the leader, undisputed, and they were kind of like, you know, making decisions. With the U.S.-China tension, is that, and the fact that there is a challenger to that position, um, or there's an unacceptance of the authority uh, of a leader of the world, does that make it harder for global cooperation? 
it may it may somewhat on the other hand i think that other countries who desperately don't want to choose between the united <laughs> states and china should find more attractiveness in broad international fora yeah. where they don't have to uh choose so i think the right course involves reform of the fora we have including reform of uh the multilateral development banks super okay i um, i think we'll open up some questions can i get a show of hands how many questions there are so i can just uh, get a sense whether that should be rapid fire first or after okay yeah please the front here first row thank you thank you anant uh, larry mr singh for an interesting conversation uh, my question to you is if you were to have this conversation if anant were to invite you back in 2030 uh, what might be the one thing that uh, satisfies you if you were to crystal ball gaze sitting there or disappoints you or surprises you in 2030 uh what will really be most surprising is not withstanding the incontrovertible controvertible logic and rationale for strengthening international cooperation particularly the reach of multilateral development banks uh both for concessional and non concessional finance what would surprise me in 2030 the notwithstanding this report several other reports and this rec greater recognition on the need to change the course of history in which this cooperation has taken place action remains hesitant and tardy that would surprise me in 2030 in a very awkward sense what would fill me with great joy and uh, with a degree of optimism that uh, these uh, some of these recommendations which we are making would get the kind of traction and support which we very much hope and we very much pray and that a sense of international concerted action envelops the framework of international cooperation and the dialogue between now and 2030 and that notwithstanding other distractions of some geopolitical events uh, any untoward things like the like for instance the possibility of food and energy crisis or the war prevents this kind of reasonable action in a manner which we do not at the moment foresee much less anticipate Larry your answer I I'll, I'll rephrase the question a little bit it's 2030 all your proposals have been accepted they've been acted on both volume 1 volume 2 and the six and the and the and the other volumes that follow what does the world look like uh, is india is is india is america still at the top of the pyramid is the in 2030 what's changed these are not proposals about changing the order of countries on the pyramid <laughs> and we're not seeing this as a who's at the top of uh the league table i think the 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 big change if these proposals are implemented is there is a sense that the world is on a clear trajectory towards coal not being bur burned for electricity anymore there is a sense that the world is on a trajectory towards um net zero emissions and towards some recovery of carbon from the atmosphere using uh the power of uh techno technology and that there is a sense of greater confidence that global problems can be solved because not everything's been done and there's a huge amount of work that looks to be done but that it looks like we're getting ahead through technology and markets of uh the global energy challenge global climate challenge and that very crucially we're doing it without pulling up the gangplanks instead of the strategy being that countries that are poor shouldn't use energy so they don't pollute the air because the air's already been polluted by countries that are rich yeah. the strategy is going to be the opposite of pulling up the gangplanks it's going uh to be a strategy 
of promoting resource, of uh, promoting energy use, just healthy energy use. Would you accept, though, that, you know, uh, when you're talking about India being an open market and America coming in, aside from importing American products and using American products, we are also, in a sense, importing American lifestyles, uh, which is far more exploitative, you know, of natural resources than the Indian lifestyle is. It's far more wasteful uh, than Indian lifestyle is. So, of course, nobody wants to live in poverty and that we have to change that. But is there also a sense of, uh, you know, I mean, we're doing all of this, one of the main reasons is climate change. Uh, is there also a sense of reverse learning some of the th ways that India lives? I'm not a believer in asceticism as a solution to major global issues. I'm not a solution because I don't think that populations are going to buy it. And we're having enough trouble selling to populations, much less difficult uh, things for them to uh, accept, like avoiding excessive budget deficits or uh, using more uh, clean energy. So I guess I don't think asceticism is going to really be at the center of this discussion. Fair. Yes, please, Mr. Cooper, in my care, please. And can I keep the hands up a little bit so you get to know what that is? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think it's on. Yeah. Hi, well, thanks very much for your very, very illuminating talk. I have, just have a question that uh, a large part of your report focuses on global cooperation, and that's sort of essential to what you want to achieve. But like today, the, one of the major blocks to global cooperation is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And uh, this block doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. It looks like it's going to continue for a, quite some time to come. Uh, how, how will that impact what you want to achieve? And uh, will that affect the, uh, the ability of the United States to really affect global cooperation? Well, I don't think that the uh, issues of the interruption of the nature of global cooperation uh, certainly become more challenging. Uh, but it doesn't go away with this, with this uh, war in Europe on Ukraine. What is more likely is that uh, if the resources of some of the countries get increasingly engaged in the reconstruction of Ukraine, which I think is a, is a humanitarian necessity, or if the resources continue to go in this direction, uh, the extent to which it would uh, impair the, both the appetite and the fiscal room for countries to beef up the extent of support for the multilateral development banks when it comes to the recapitalization of the banks. But uh, that is an area which is of concern, but it will not detract from the ongoing international cooperation. It will not detract from the efforts to really make them more purposive, and to substantially increase the capacity to harness private capital to address the issues which are global of climate in terms of harnessing, for instance, much cheaper sources of renewable energy, of solar and wind, or, for instance, changing the patterns of economic activity uh, which will be more dependent on renewable fuels, or the harnessing of technology in multiple ways I do not think it will detract from that, and all that uh, is only possible if the ability of international institutions to meet the financial needs is uh, in some way more credibly addressed. Larry, Manmohan Singh, the past prime minister of a different uh, political party, said that India's done a good job handling Russia uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interview to the Indian Express. Do you agree with him? Do you think India's done a good job handling Russia? Specifically, do you agree that India's done a good job trying to trade with Russia by passing the dollar? As an American, I, I, I would have preferred that India be less reliant on Russia for its military hardware. I would have preferred that India be more reliant on the dollar as a vehicle currency. 
I would have preferred that India had done less that helped circumvent the sanctions on uh, Russia. So as an American, I think my preference is clear. I understand the choices that India has made. I think there's a balance to be struck. And I guess my recommendation to my Indian friends would be that they think about the stake they have in a world, given that they have some pretty good, pretty dangerous borders yep. in which wanton international aggression is resisted. And that attempting to see this conflict in Ukraine, and look, the United States may have made some mistakes, but attempting to see this conflict in Ukraine in symmetric terms, I think is a very serious error. Okay. Mr. Surana has a question here, yes? And then, yeah, please go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, hi. Hi, um, having agreed that uh, the climate crisis is the biggest crisis uh, facing humanity, we all keep on debating how to fund it. We had recently a climate summit in Africa where uh, one of the suggestions made was a debt moratorium. So it's not a forgiveness of debt, but it is a moratorium. Given that some African countries are paying as much as 60% of their GDP as debt, would a moratorium actually help accelerate funding this global climate effort rather than a, multi, a multinational bank or a uh, private capital? Look, I think there probably are some areas where a moratorium on debt service should be looked at, but I think I would tend to prefer climate-specific policies to solve climate problems uh, to, a, uh, greater, uh, to a greater extent. But look, the world is going to have to come back on debt issues more than it has already. Yes, Mr. Surana? Yeah. Hi, Larry. Um, Given the polarization in American politics and some dysfunction in Washington and the importance of the U.S. to global economic growth, do you see any risks uh, coming for future global growth, depending on the party that comes into power, Republicans, Democrats, because the policies are so different? Look, the answer to all questions of the form, do you see any risks? is yes, because if, if the risk doesn't materialize, and if the risk does materialize and you said there was no chance of it, then you were kind of made a big mistake. And if the risk doesn't materialize, well, that's because you recognize the risk and help to contribute to preventing it. So I always answer questions of the form, is there a risk that by saying uh, yes? Am I scared about the prospect of the U.S. election going towards Donald Trump in a way that I have not been scared about elections going to other Republicans because he seems to me to be a much more deeply subversive figure of both national and international tradition? Yes, I very much have those fears. I remain optimistic, though certainly not completely confident, that um, there's a cycle and there's an electoral rhythm. And two and a half years in, presidents tend to be at the low edge of those cycles. And then things often, uh, often uh, come back. So it's a very serious um, issue and a very serious concern. And I don't want to do anything uh, to uh, minimize uh, the concern. I think it's going to be crucial for President Biden to get out as many votes um, as uh, he can uh, from the Democratic side. And I also think that reaching to independence by making clear that there's nothing extreme culturally in what Democrats want to do is helpful as well. The India Middle East Europe corridor as competition to the BRI, to, the, uh, to China's BRI, irrespective of which government comes to power in America, they're both going to be equally invested in making that experiment work. I think both, I think yeah. any American government now yeah. is going to see that as an important initiative, both substantively in terms of what it means for the countries involved and also significant as a counterweight to BRI. Yeah. 
Is there any question on education that if we can ask Larry? Because I want to ask him education. I'm running out of time. So I, I hope there's something in the audience. If not, then I will go for it. Yes, please. Uh, you talked about cooperation uh, in the global order, but for it to work, the leadership uh, in a disparate group of countries, the leadership has to display a sense of magnanimity, avoidance of duplicity, and basic code of integrity in conducting affairs in a global order. But one of the features that one notices in last few decades is a precipitous decline in the intellectual and moral leadership, whether you talk about finance, uh, polity, culture, and societal uh, uh, trends. And therefore, when the leaders, uh, Western world in general, and America in particular, I would think, if that is the code of conduct, how do you really ensure global cooperation to be built? <clears throat> well, uh, I think that the art of a successful international political and economic diplomacy is uh, notwithstanding the differences to strike a degree of arrangement and harmony which allows progress to take place. I mean, uh, I think that uh, the outcome of the G20, then uh, any, in recent times, has been a particularly uh, laudable one of being able to bring about a common document and to be able to agree on a communique. And I think this is a success of both political and economic diplomacy. It embeds many thoughts. If you read the daily declaration, it spans from multilateral economic cooperation and systems, almost every area of international cooperation in some form or the other has been mentioned in the daily declaration. It's a good example, I think, of uh, meaningful international cooperation in a larger configuration. Larry, one of, the, uh, one of the clouds that loomed over G20 in the Delhi Declaration was what happened in Canada immediately after G20. And reports now coming that, uh, that Biden had brought it up with Modi uh, when he met him in, uh, in India. What is your view on that? Because I mean, is America stuck between a rock and a hard place in this equation? Or? I range pretty far behind, beyond economics, but there's some places to which I do not range. Okay. And so I'm going to just stay out of that one. <laughs> okay, I think I want to ask you one thing about education, because we haven't got one. You know, you made a, uh, while just preparing for this, I was watching some of your interviews. You get a lovely statement. I want to read it out. You said, we have gone from thinking that self-esteem comes from achievement to thinking that achievement comes from self-esteem. Uh, this is your, your sentence, your statement in the context of how uh, students are assessed and what students are aspiring to in colleges. Um, there's a report talking about how now almost half of Americans don't want to go to university. Um, how, what is the future of the great American university? I think the great American universities are going to be OK. There are always going to be plenty of students who are extremely able, who want to go to Harvard, Harvard's got a $50 billion endowment. Harvard's got some extraordinary faculty in many fields who I was pleased to meet when I became president. So I'm not worried about whether Harvard's going to be okay. I'm worried about whether American educational institutions like Harvard and probably much more importantly, our public schools from K to 12 are going to do what they need to do to make sure that the future of the country is what it should be. Because I think there are a variety of attitudes that have crept into our educational system that are antithetical to people being well prepared 
for a tough world. I find it almost unimaginable, but it is true that on a 4.0 scale, where four is an A and three is a B and two is a C, the average grade point average at Harvard is now above 3.7. So it's like more than 70% A's, yep. 27, 30% B's, and no C's. Uh, it's not exactly what it is, yeah. but that gives you a sense of how inflated the grades are. Many of our great universities no longer have entrance exams, and they judge people on the basis of the essays they write describing all the things they have been through um, in uh, life. Our schools, the idea is seriously put forward that because some groups do better in math and other groups do worse and we need to have equality that we should put less emphasis on math in uh, schools. And so equality, I think this... You have equality? We put less, how, how does equality in math come into play? The idea is that there some, uh, some groups tend on average to do worse on math tests than other groups. So if we just don't have math tests, then we'll have equality between all the groups. That idea is seriously uh, um, put forward in many places in the United States. The state of California was giving very serious consideration to, instead of teaching or in addition to teaching conventional mathematics, teaching something called social justice mathematics, where the problems involve percentages to show how unjust uh, the world was. Well, that's not gonna make us in a strong position to be the world's driver of progress. And so I'm not worried about Harvard, I'm worried about the attitudes and values and culture that is being inculcated by many of our educational institutions which I think is away from the idea that there is really such a thing as truth and we need to approach it more accurately, the idea that there really is such a thing as excellence and that these things are not just self, uh, are not just uh, social uh, constructions, the idea that the best way to prepare people for the world is to have there be a measure of competition, not to have sports events where everybody is said to have won. Yeah. And I think we are having some real problems with that uh, culturally uh, in uh, the United States. And you know, one of the most interesting experiences I had uh, on a previous visit to India was attending a school where NK's daughter was centrally involved. And that school didn't have any of those ideas. That school, I remember it very vividly, that different, these boys were maybe 13 or 14 years old, and they had to wear a tie and jacket to school. So that was already something that wouldn't happen in the United States. And I noticed that different boys were wearing different color ties. And I asked why that was. And the answer was that the kids who did best got to wear one color tie, and other kids got to wear a different color tie. Uh, was this cathedral tie. school? Because that's what I... <laughs> well, <laughs> that type, I don't know whether that's a good idea. Frankly, that seemed a bit too tough and yeah. stigmatizing to me, so I probably wouldn't have been for... It happened in my school. I probably school. wouldn't have been for that idea. But, like, that idea would have been completely inconceivable and unconscionable yeah. in the context of the American education system. And I think it's a question about how countries uh, stay great. Do you think that colleges sh should remain noisy places? I mean, there's, there's a view in India now that colleges shouldn't be so noisy, that, you know, that... that uh, you know, it's not a place for a lot of activism. It's not, it's not the place for 
uh, opinions. I don't know what noisy means. If should there be lots of vigorous debate on campuses? Absolutely. Should people disagree with each other? Abso uh, absolutely. Should students dictate what the curriculum is going to be? <laughs> absolutely not. There's a view that should, ideologically, though. Should but students um, should uh, the process of education be disrupted because people have views about the issues of the day? I think in sufficiently extreme cases, the answer might be yes. But as a normal matter, um, I think sure. the answer to that question should be no. OK, we're going to go into a quick rapid fire. I want you to have fun with this. Um, and so it's a rapid fire, so try to answer quickly. Um, I start with Mr. Singh. Um, the 16th Finance Commission is going to kind of get together by November. Now, you said 42% is the, is, is the amount of share of the central re revenue that, that should go to the states. In the 16th Finance Commission, would you, what would you, rec you recommend? It stay 42, it increase, or it decrease? It is, one of the rule, it is one of the unwritten rules that one Finance Commission doesn't comment on the other Finance Commission. <laughs> Let me respect that. OK. If you were to take a guess, how long before one nation, one election gets implemented? I have no idea it's speculative. Okay. on that. Okay. It would be a purely speculative question. Fair. Does not deserve even a speculative answer. Fine, fine. How would you rate the success of the largest institution of global cooperation, the United Nations? Question to both of you. Scale of 1 to 10. Professors give a grade. Incomplete. <laughs> um, there's a lot that's happened that's positive. There's a lot that's left to do. I'm trying to get a number or a grade. You got what you got, Fred. <laughs> uh, five. Five, OK. Thank you. Um, if there was one currency other than your respective home currencies that you were both forced to save half your personal wealth in, which mm. currency would you choose? You can't say the dollar. <laughs> oh, uh, I can't say the dollar. I would say the rupee. Not the home currency and not the dollar for you? Oh, not the dollar. Uh, strangely, I would opt for yen. For the yen, OK. Larry? I was taught to always diversify. And I would hold a diversified basket of currencies. Okay. So I'm not going to answer that question. Larry, when's the last time you agreed with the decision the US Fed has made? I, I, I thought the Fed was, was way off course in 2021, but they've moved very quickly to raise interest rates, and that's been broadly the right thing to do. So I've been in general sympathy with what they've done for the last year. Uh, for both of you, benefit of hindsight, your report card for the role of the finance minister of India, how have they performed? The, the finance the, minister, Nirmala Sitamaraman's. The role means the, the, what the role the should be or how has she performed? performance over the last four years. It's been a tumultuous. Oh, in the last four years, years yeah. of this government, yes. in, of the current finance minister. Yes, her I term. would give a very high rating. I'd give closer to eight. Larry? India's done very well economically. That's the test of a finance minister, so high grades. OK. Uh, Mr. Singh, one advice you would give Jerome Powell today? Oh, uh, difficult. I think that he has many advisors and many problems. But uh, I think that a continuation of uh, maintaining the stability of macroeconomic policy uh, is a paramount for long-term stability and growth. Okay. Larry, one That's advice. going out on a limb. NK has boldly recommended that the Federal Reserve focus on maintaining the stability of macroeconomic policy. That is a reckless recommendation, <laughs> my friend. Wow, this sounds fun. I wish I, I wish I was there when you guys were debating the report. That would be <laughs> fun to watch how you disagree. Larry, your chance to make a bold statement, go out a limb. Your recommendation to India, Shakti Kanta Das.
Um, accelerate the work of uh, financial reform, put more of finance into the private sector where money can find its highest uh, and best value. 20th century financial repression has no place in mid 21st century India's economy. Cool, two very bold statements. I'm feeling good about my rapid fire round. Um, Mr. Singh, one piece of advice for U.S. current Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. Uh, considering, consider favorably the recommendations which uh, we are about to make on uh, the need for recapitalization of uh, the multilateral development banks. Larry, you can guess my next question. Your advice to the Finance Minister of India. Invest your political capital in the very important recommendations put forward by N.K. Singh <laughs> in the valuable report uh, that he has co uh, that he has co that he has co-produced. Uh, Larry, the one thing that Indian universities can learn from American ones. Compete with each other. Compete with each other for faculty. Compete with each other for students. Compete with each other as to the attractiveness of programs. Bring as many people in from abroad as uh, you can. Send students abroad. Be open and competitive rather than being uh, closed and comfortable. The one thing that American education can learn from India? The, to remember the traditional virtues of excellence, merit, and pride through achievement. The one thing that most urgently needs reform in American universities? The uh, unwilling, the, there needs to be more willingness to accept uh, discomfort. Um, dis uncomfortable ideas, difficult uh, debates, honest feedback, on uh, poor performance. One thing that urgently needs reform at Harvard. I think Harvard probably is, uh, is like uh, other, university, uh, other universities uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. If we can, if we at Harvard can stay faithful to the idea of our motto, veritas and uh, truth. And we can remember that there are many parts of society that can pursue social justice, but that it's the special and unique functions of universities to try to seek truth better and to pass that truth on to next generations. That's what I think is most important. The one thing that Biden could learn from Clinton? There are some places uh, I don't want to go. Um, and uh, so I am, my colleague is like looking at me, desperately afraid that I'm gonna give some kind of attempt at a candid answer <laughs> to that question, but I'm not gonna be so foolish uh, as, to, as to do that. Look, I've been privileged to work very closely with three presidents, um, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and during his time as vice president, uh, Joe Biden. And I would say the most important lesson that I learned about leadership from all three of them is that there's no single formula for leadership, that you have to be true to yourself and you have to do it in a way that you're comfortable with in there aspects of what Bill Clinton does that Joe Biden couldn't remotely do. There are aspects of the way Joe Biden does things that Bill Clinton couldn't remotely have done.
But they ultimately understood what is, I think, the single most important thing and skill for a political leader to understand, which is that goodwill is like capital. It is really important to build it up, but that there is no point in building it up for its own sake. The reason you build it up is so that you can spend it on the things that are most uh, important uh, to you. And that, it seems to me, is a hallmark of uh, great leaders. And I think it's something that Bill Clinton and Joe Biden, each in their own way, and Barack Obama, have had in common. So I'm uh, probably in vain, but I'll try one more time with different names. The one thing that Clinton could have learned from Obama. I, I think I'm going to stick with stick the, I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to stick with uh, the answer uh, yeah. that uh, that I that I gave. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Singh. The one thing that Modi should learn from Bajpai. Uh, having had the privilege of working closely with both, I think that they both uh, have a degree of sagacity and a style which is unique to them. Are you going to, I'm expecting more candidness than, than I got from Larry, so I'll try with another one. The one skill that Modi has that Vajpayee didn't. Uh, this, what did you say? The one, the one, the one attribute, the one, the one skill that Modi has that Vajpayee didn't have. A hawkish eye on implementation of policies and programs. Okay. Um, Larry, your favorite scene in the movie Social Network. The only scene I remember is the one that I was in um, and the one that, where I was portrayed and it was not exactly right. I certainly never said to anybody, punch me in the face, but the general impression left by the scene that the Winklevoss twins came storming into my office making demands that Harvard get involved with their commercial dispute with Mark Zuckerberg, and that I said there was no way Harvard was gonna get involved and that they should work it out between themselves or with courts. Okay. That's basically accurate. Okay. Should America reach out and thaw relationships between, with China? Yes or no? China and America should get closer uh, to gather and recognize their common stake in the planet. Who should make the first step? It's like, uh, as in any relationship, uh, it's reciprocity that is, uh, that is, that is particular, particularly important. Okay. Yay or nay to Supreme Court's decision to disallow affirmative action at Harvard? Nay. I think that uh, Harvard should be able to make its own admissions policies based on its own uh, admissions philosophy. I think, though, that uh, we should, in admissions, put much more weight than has currently been put on helping people who have had a generalized uh, disadvantage in life, which can come in many forms. And I would rather see us give much more preference to very disadvantaged uh, people who have come out of majority ethnic groups over extremely privileged people from uh, minority ethnic groups. And so the question of privilege versus disadvantage should, I believe, loom much larger in our educational uh, decisions and the question of identity should loom much less large. Super. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a wonderful, I've had a lovely time. I hope you all have had one as well because, you know, this is a, this is a double bill, Adda, which is very rare. You know, each individual here I can talk to for at least two hours and now to do them together, one and a half hours, each would probably go on for hours more. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Hand it over to the MC. Yeah. Thank you, Anand, for the fabulous session. May I now invite Raj Kamal Jha, Chief Editor of the Indian Express, to present a token of appreciation.
These illustrations are by Shubhajit De. As we conclude, I'd like to thank our partners, presenting partner, Religare Enterprises Limited, co-presenting partner, 3P Investment Managers, Reliance Industries Limited, associate partner, Tata 361 Wealth, FRR Immigration. Please stay back and join us for cocktail. <laughs>